Skyhawks, four or five, came low across the bay to bomb the two landing ships, unloading men and supplies. Although missiles were fired, proper air defences hadn't yet been installed. One of the ships, Sir Galahad, burst into flames immediately. The ship had been carrying two companies of the Welsh Guards. For those who had been anchored for several hours, they were still aboard. The helicopters, which had been moving equipment forward, now flocked to help rescue survivors. smoke poured out as the guards ammunition started to ignite the helicopters disappeared into the black cloud trying to pull men from the waters Again and again, the pilots risk their lives to save others. On the clifftops, medical staff waited for the helicopters to bring the casualties to them. In the middle of the airlift, another air raid was called, but the orderlies kept working ignoring the crates of ammunition stacked in the grass around about. Many of the injuries were burns. So sudden was the attack, there had not been time for the crew to put on their anti-flash masks. It's old. Oh, what about this one? Just wipe up his ass. You got this one no, right, no, yeah? No, Just cold. It's clear you get the shot. Get your pieces at him. Let's do it and hang on, what? Yeah. Around in the water, orange life rafts started to drift back to the ship. The helicopters used their rotors to fan the light rubber boats back out of harm's way towards the shore. Once the casualties were clear, the helicopters brought in other survivors, among them the bewildered members of the Chinese crew. Like many of the fleet auxiliaries, Sir Galahad recruited from Hong Kong.
In the confusion, it took hours to find out who'd survived and who had not. The priority was to save the living, not count the dead. The fire, fanned by the wind, spread at tremendous speed along the ship. If the shore hadn't been so close, the loss of life could have been even worse. That one was hit twice over there in the back. Throughout the whole rescue, there was the constant crackle of ammunition and the sound of bigger explosions aboard Sir Galahad. It took several hours to gather up all the boats and pull them into the shore. The medics waded out into the cold water, checking if anyone was hurt.
But that wasn't the end of it. The other landing ship, Sir Tristram, began to smoke. It had been hit in the same raid, although the fire took longer to gain a hold. But that ship, too, was lost, burning fiercely in the night. In a week of raids at San Carlos, not a single storeship or troop ship had been sunk. Now, two had been lost in a single raid. That report it had been air attack Argentina could mount and the deaths of so many men of the ship and especially of the Welsh guards. The ship's captain said today he couldn't comment on the air cover then. Another officer said he was extremely upset. He said they'd been told there was little danger of an attack and no Harrier planes were visible at the outset. The other news is of fighting in Lebanon and of strikes and threatened strikes and inconvenience in the health service and on the railways here. Fifty men, 32 from the Welsh Guards, died in the attack on the Sir Galahad 16 days ago. Many others were badly burned. This is the first film that has come back. Our correspondent, Michael Nicholson, saw it all. Nothing could have been more relaxed that Tuesday afternoon. The fifth were settled in. More supply ships had arrived in the estuary next to us, bringing in more men and more weapons for them to use. Men even took time off to fish for a change of diet. But then came the attack. The Skyhawks came in to attack and were out again with our gunfire chasing them too late. So sudden, so unannounced, we knew nothing until we saw the black smoke billowing out of the landing ship, Sir Galahad. And then the first signs of a fire aboard St. Tristram nearby. The attack happened so fast, there wasn't even time to think of taking cover. And as the ships were hit, many men aboard hadn't even time to pull on their anti-burn masks to save themselves from the heat flash as the bombs exploded. The two landing ships, Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram, were bombed within 200 yards of each other as they were unloading supplies of ammunition and of men. They were in a narrow estuary at Fitzroy, leading off from Bluff Cove. The men had come to join the rest of their brigade here at Fitzroy, only seven miles from Stanley. Sir Galahad had anchored only a few hours before, and the men were waiting for landing craft to come and get them. One hour later, and most of the men would have been safely ashore in their trenches. Our air defense missile, which most Argentine pilots respect, had come off the ships in the morning, but was still being set up on the hillside overlooking the estuary. Had the Argentine planes come just that one hour later, rapier would have been ready for them. The bombs hit Sir Galahad aft through the engine room and accommodation sections. I watched from the shore less than 400 yards away and felt the impact on the ground below me as the hold full of ammunition exploded. Many were brought ashore with dreadful burns. Bullets came from their ammunition boxes exploding in the heat, whistling and whirring past us. What about this one? Just wrap up his arms. You want this one right now? Just cold. It's clicking at the shoulder. Sure, it's freezing his arm. Let's do that hang on, watch.
I saw hundreds of men rush forward along the decks, across the hold, pulling on their life jackets, pulling on their survival suits. Some, the ship's crewmen, just off watch, pulling on their shirts and trousers. Men were trapped on the wrong side of the fire, and not knowing what else to do, they jumped overboard, the flames spreading around them. I saw men swim underwater, away from the ship to avoid the burning oil. And as they surfaced, I watched other men, men who were safely away forward of the flames, risk their own lives, jumping into the water with life jackets to save those men swimming below them. Inflatable rubber life rafts, bright orange, were hurled over the side. Some immediately burst into flames as debris from the explosions hit them. Others landed, but were blown by the wind into the burning oil. Ropes were thrown down the side of the ship, and men clambered down them, and despite the wind, despite the heat of the metal on their feet, despite the movement of the ship swinging them backwards and forwards along the side of the hull, they got down into their life rafts. The strong wind, gusting now, fanned the fires, enormous fires, as the fuel tanks exploded. The ship was half enveloped in black, thick smoke now, but the Royal Navy Sea King and Wessex helicopter pilots and their crews ignored the fires, they ignored the explosions and the ammunition erupting around them, and flew their machines into the smoke to lift the queues of men waiting below them. The helicopters waited in turn, steady in the air, to move in once the one in front of them had moved away, to winch the men off. I watched one pilot steer his machine slowly and deliberately into the black air and hover, completely blinded, enveloped in the smoke. And then we saw his crewman winching down a line to pick a man out of the sea. Three times that winchman went down and three times he brought men up, up into the blackness that covered his helicopter. I saw another helicopter almost touch the water. Its rotor blades seemed to be spinning through the flames to pick up a man in a bright orange survival suit who was clinging to the anchor chain. Lifeboats were launched from Sir Tristan, the other ship, whose crew seemed to be containing their fire, and these boats, under power, began taking some of the rubber life craft in tow. Others began drifting, though, taken by the wind sometimes away from the inferno, but then suddenly towards it. Pilots in the helicopters saw this, and immediately four of them took their machines to the rear of the ship by the flames, came down low, and using the downdraft of their rotor blades, slowly began to push the rubber dinghies away. And slowly, yard by yard, each helicopter taking care of one dinghy full of men, they pushed them safely onto the beach. There was much heroism at Fitzroy, but this single tribute must be paid to the helicopter pilots and their winchmen who saved so many.
the casualties and survivors, many suffering from shock, many who had heard their own friends screaming in the locked dormitories, unable to get out, were picked up from the beach by soldiers who had run from their trenches to help. of soldiers waded out into the freezing water up to their chests in it to pull men to safety. I watched soldiers struggling in the water, picking the injured out of the life rafts and carrying them on their shoulders back to the shore and then go back again for more. Yeah, 
Others were helped and carried up the steep slope of the beach to the waiting armoured cars and the light tanks. Some were helped inside, others were so badly injured, strapped tight to the stretcher, that they had to be lifted on top of the tanks and driven to the field hospital. From Fitzroy, after emergency treatment, they were flown by helicopter to the field hospital at San Carlos Water, and then onto the hospital ship Uganda. The Chinese crew, the cooks, the laundrymen, the stewards on these Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships were badly burnt, the bomb exploding in their quarters. They are normally the most cautious of all aboard these ships, the first to put on their anti-flash units, their hoods and their gloves. But no, they said, we knew nothing, we heard nothing. There was no warning, just a blast. And then we saw men with skin dripping from their heads, from their faces. It was a day of tragedy. But I vouch it was a day of extraordinary heroism and selflessness by every man who witnessed it. Michael Nicholson, News at 10, at Fitzroy, on the Falkland Islands. The pool crew on that report were cameraman Bernard Hesketh and recordist John Jockel. Ten points their position. For the final advance, 2,400 shells were needed. The helicopter could only bring in 36 at a time. It was a long and obvious business. But despite this huge stockpiling of ammunition, some guns were down to their last half dozen shells at the end. It was a close call. The helicopters darted everywhere, worked to destruction. They were pushed to the edge of their endurance again and again. There wasn't any option. They were the only way to push equipment forward fast. At dawn on Monday, we crawled out of our shelters, cold, shivering, and shaken by the severity of the bombardment which had been fired over our heads during the night. The freezing morning underlined the need to take Stanley swiftly before the cold of the mountains in midwinter sapped the strength of the troops. The air still rang with the clash of artillery. Across the valley, the battle for Tumbledown Mountain was still raging, the Scots Guards were being delayed, the whole advance was slipping behind. We watched shells still smacking down on rocks and earth. It seemed a wonder that the mountain itself could stand the bombardment without splitting. Occasionally, tiny figures flitted back and forth like matchstick men. By now, the fires surrounding Port Stanley were burning brightly.
And then, quite suddenly, the whole position changed. The Argentinians weren't fighting, they were retreating. Hasty instructions were passed on the radio nets. An airstrike was cancelled. The advancing troops were told, fire only in self-defense. More and more information came back. A white flag had been seen. It was virtually <laughs> over. <laughs> I have just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Let it <laughs> Well, here it is, just before four o'clock on Monday, the 14th of June, and up in our area overlooking the battlefield, the word has come through that a white flag is flying over Stanley. We know that British troops are still advancing on the mountains behind me, but now their orders are drastically different. They are to fire only in self-defense. And so far, there's been no sound of firing, and you'll notice that the big guns are quiet too. The first time these hills have been silent for more than three days. It doesn't mean there'll be no more fighting. We don't know what the position is in the other Argentine garrisons, but certainly Stanley has surrendered and is about to be occupied by the British. It's taken 10 weeks since we left Portsmouth, but this major objective has now been achieved. Tuesday the 15th of June, Stanley woke up to find it was back under British rule. Apart from the Union Jacks that began to sprout, there was no great demonstrations or celebrations. It was enough celebration to drive once again on the left-hand side and walk the streets without worry. What did you think when the British went to, be to begin with? I'm afraid I cried. I cried a lot because, you know, Britain had gone and all we knew had gone and it was just something totally new and unknown to us that arrives and we never knew how they would treat us and, and what would, you know, what would become of us, really. Did you think of leaving yourself? At the beginning, yes, before I realised that the forces were coming out here. But when I realised the forces were coming out here, I wanted to stay and see it through. Uh, and now? And now I want to stay, too, for appreciation for what the British troops have done for us. I want to stay. You see, we, we lived almost surrounded by the soldiers, which is known as the sort of military zone and time and time again I'd go to the door and I'd find seven or eight or nine soldiers standing there with guns and all sorts of excuses. I gave them the tape we could. I tried to be as kind and as friendly as I did and I waved to them because... because... Did, you didn't uh, know what was going to happen? No. Mm. Well. No, and so um, when, when you find these people, they, although I don't, they never hurt any civilians, not one I don't think, but it's, 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 it's just so terrifying living and brought up in a British colony as we had been. Perhaps I shouldn't even say colony now. But we were so British and then to find all these guns here, it was just terrifying. And I stood at the door and I used to cry and cry. And just the, the well, it's, it's, it's over now, isn't it? And the, yes. and the British are back. And, so. and we're very grateful and, and we can only pray and pray now that and thank God you're here and offer up a prayer for the souls of those who've lost their lives. Down from the mountains came the British troops, marching proudly through the town they'd come to liberate. How are you feeling, lad? Great. Fantastic. Get the pubs up. <laughs> Give us a cheer. Yep. <laughs> They didn't look like men who just walked across the island, but they had every step of the way on their own two feet. Fifty miles they'd come over mountains and bogs in weather that chilled the bone and soaked the skin. And at the end of it, they'd fought bravely and well. Now they were coming in from the cold for a hot meal, a bath and a change of clothes, the first in three weeks. <coughs> Everything had hinged on the fitness and the resource of the Marines and the paratroopers who'd come ashore on that first day and never stopped walking. I'm delighted that we've got into Stanley and that though our casualties have been uh, sad, we've had far lighter casualties than I expected when one looks around at what's in Stanley in the way of weapons and how many men were holding the place. So I'm extremely glad that they decided that... Uh, they would rather have a ceasefire. Well, why do you think you, you've got away so lightly? I know any deaths are tragic, but in because, military terms, this is very low, isn't yes, it? Yes, because our guys were very well trained, 
Uh, we had very good artillery support, and we tended to use the night as our friend to attack, which helped us uh, enormously in that we were able to close with them uh, during the hours of darkness, and then have to fight through, admittedly, in darkness. But uh, at least we didn't have to walk for uh, long distances over these very open hills being fired at while we were closing with them. Mm -hmm. well, mind you, you had to walk all the way across the island. What condition is everybody in now? Well, remarkably good. And when you've just seen 4-5 Commander go past, you realize they've walked from Port San Carlos to Stanley, and then in the end spent two days dug in on Sapper Hill. And they've spent all the time dug in, moving forward, marching and fighting. I reckon mm. they look pretty good in spite mm. of that, it's don't been you? Snow cold, everything up there. Yes, isn't it? very cold. So much so that one of the company commanders, who was a very large and uh, tough officer, told me that he was actually blown off his feet on the top of Mount Kent by the by the wind, which is quite something. <laughs> For the Marines of Naval Party 8901, it was a happy homecoming. They were the detachment who defended Port Stanley against the original Argentine invasion. Now they were back, raising their flag outside Government House. The Falklands flag, a Union Jack, inset with a sheep. The first problem was what to do with the Argentine troops laying down their weapons in great piles in the streets of Stanley. They'd had plenty of guns, plenty of ammunition, but lacked the will to fight on. They'd expected to be beaten, they were. The British troops never thought defeat a possibility. In the last hours before the surrender, Argentine officers and men were reported to be firing at each other. Now they were marched out to Stanley Airfield in thousands. But the British counted just over 6,000. The Argentine officers said there were twice as many. Nobody was totally sure how many men there were what units they'd come from. The airfield, several miles from the town, made an extraordinary sight it looked like a refugee camp with long lines of men trudging through the mud. They were left there to fend for themselves until ships could take them back to Argentina. They lived off their own rations, made shelter from whatever they could find. The British put a sentry on the road to Stanley and left them to sort themselves out. There was nowhere they could go, nothing for them to do but wait forlornly among the wreckage. The airfield, out on a headland, is a desolate, windswept place, made worse by the wreckage of the British bombing and shelling. Bukata aircraft stood about, some destroyed, others bright, almost new, strangely so in the devastation. The airport buildings were skeletons, blown apart by the British bombardment, which continued until the last moment. Huge craters showed where the Vulcan bombs had been dropped. But despite the enormous firepower directed at it, the runway was still serviceable. With the fighting over, General Moore, the land force, the first, again, into Port Stanley, and the first to march through...